did your artistic background, a relative working in art, uh, give you a reason to spread yours? I think coming from a family where most people had artistic professions, jobs, I um, really wanted to become something else. I wanted to get a education at university to become a lawyer, for example. I would love to have worked for Greenpeace or Amnesty International or anything like that. But in fact, after years of studying and doing certain different sorts of jobs, I realized that I am much better to work on my own discipline than to work according the expectations of others. When you get a job and you're employed, you're having a boss, then you need to feel comfortable with all sorts of um, advices, of, um, of um, directions. I did so many different sorts of jobs. I didn't care about cleaning houses, uh, babysitting, um, working in hospital, um, working at the radio station. But what I didn't like in all of those jobs were the fractures of my work, which were um, made by the di directions of all the bosses. So maybe working as a um, writer or an artist always also means um, that you don't have any vacation or weekend. There is no free time because um, being an artist, you are completely occupied with your things you have to do and you have in your mind. There is no um, free time at all. So even when I um, prepare dinner for my children at night, my mind is observed and, and occupied by those things writing on, at least also for me and my sisters, it was very hard to be sometimes even on weekends in childcare institutions because my mother had been a theater actress and she definitely had to work on weekends as well at night and all the time. So we, when we were children, we knew how, it, how hard it is to have a family being an artist. Why did you choose uh, writing? because it's the most hidden art of all of them. I think I always felt uncomfortable with the very specific um, side of, uh, for example, films or acting when people have to go on stages and would be looked by everybody and watched and, and everybody would look at you. And, and I didn't like that um, feeling being watched or being counted by your surface. What I love about literature, when I started to grow, not only listen to um, the oral stories and tales our um, mother or friends told us at night, um, but when I started to read, I really love to have my inner imagination while reading, to have a whole um, movie which takes place when I read a book. And it's not on the screen, but it's in me. And I just love that um, communication aspect and the dialogue between the text itself and the inner side of the reader. Why the Germany history of the 20th century had such an impact on your work? Good question. Um, the very first three books of mine didn't had almost any influence by German history. But the elder I got, the more I realized that I really have to or wanted to explore the stories and also the experiences I made in my life, as well my family and my people, let's say, like this. And since my family is a very non-typical German family, containing all those breaks of um, Germany's history, like my maternal family is Jewish, my 
paternal family was not. I was born in Berlin, then at those times, 1970, it was East Berlin, so it was the communistic part of Germany, but only by chance, like four generations before my grand grandmother, my maternal grand grandmother, my Jewish grand grandmother, she was a Berliner as well. But in her times, Germany wasn't divided. So even when she was born in Berlin Schöneberg, or my grandmother was born in Berlin Charlottenburg, which both were um, Western. Um, districts of the city, it didn't mean that my mother or we would have been born in the same country. So the country itself changed so much during the last century and it infected and influenced the shape, the growth of my family very severe. So um, I think I could not avoid to write also with a historical background because it had such a strong influence to my family. Do the characters of your book are related to your past? In many ways they are. I would still say that all my um, figures are fiction or fictionalized, but many figures have a lot in common with um, me, myself, or people I know. It got stronger during the last three novels, which all have that um, German historical background. Plus, I would say that all our dreams and our inventions, our fiction, is the most subjective and individual, special individual side on world, on life, on issues that you can take or give because it's um, it's not only information, it's really very subjective. So, Is there a link between your artistic work and your daily life? Actually both are mingled all the time and they're linked in a very complex way because on one hand I um, I cannot stop thinking about my work or my writing when my children come back at home or when I meet friends or when I visit a um, theater or a movie or whatever. I cannot stop my thinking. Especially in very intense phases of my work, I would all the time see relations and connections to what I experience in my environment. So it always shows its connection. Of course, working hours, they are mainly between, let's say, eight and four o'clock. They are very reserved only for working. So this is a time where I would switch my phone off and I wouldn't answer anybody at the door or any disturbing from outside. But then, of course, it also infects and influences my um, private life. Like, um, for example, I remember when I wrote on that last novel, La Femme de Midi, my son was very small then and he was five years old and still in maternal school. And when I picked him up, I realized in a very intense period of my writing, I realized his changing behavior. Like um, I picked him up and he was very relieved I would pick him up. And he told me, Mommy, do you know, I all the day I was scared you wouldn't f pick me up and you could forget about me. And I found it so strange. It was really very touching because it was the time when I was writing about the little boy who got abandoned by his mother. And this story, this detail is also a biographical detail from my father's side. My father had been abandoned when he was eight years old by his mother. 
who um, had been a nurse, like in the book, and I never knew um, and never met his mother ever because they were separated up from then. And my father had only told me very little about his mother. Plus, he died very early when he was 49. He had a brain cancer then and died. So I never found out about the reasons of that woman. And it was very shocking for me since I never told my son or my daughter, I never told them that there was a biographical trauma or that I would write a book about this and that. So they didn't know. And only by the um, silent social transfer, which is a very, very interesting thing among families, only by this social transfer, my son got those fear I could forget about him. Maybe one day he would wait and wait and I would never return. This was very, very strange to me. So this was a very hard period of work for me because I always tried to separate private life and being my, a mother myself and writing on that book. Yeah. Can you explain the way you're working, your writing process? Actually, I would say that it takes a lot longer time to think about a book. Either it's a novel or a short story or an essay. In my experience, it almost took three times as much of time doing research, reading, collecting things in mind, making little notes for the book to condense, to characterize the main figures and the whole structure of a book, which also has a lot to do with a um, dramatic span, with how to, how to construct, it's almost like architecture a little bit, how to construct a novel, if it's a long novel. And I think a poet would say the same about a poem. But um, when it comes to writing, I always try to have at least two weeks without any other disturbance, no social contact like um, meeting friends. In my very ascetic and like a monk's um, cell space, I didn't even have the children around. So I tried to have the very beginning of a novel in summer vacation of my children because then they are somewhere where they just are around other kids and I don't have to think of them. And I can only concentrate on my figures and my book and this voice, which is very important. And up from then, after two, three, four weeks, I'm so much into the flow that I can just um, start at 8 in the morning and end up at maybe at 4. I used to do no break in between, no lunch, because any lunch would just make me tired or disconcentrated. And then I get to my children, do all the domestical things which are needed. And then when they were little, I could start writing at eight at night again and just using like the night until midnight. If the way your work depends on the subjects you are dealing with? Yes, of course. All books are very different to me. Um, and it also has a lot to do with the preparing. For some books I needed to do a lot of research or I wanted to do a lot of research, which also is another very important aspect of my work that I could not imagine just to write without any interests or without any need to work. When I'm writing or preparing a book, I'm a researcher. Yeah, I more and more um, try to elaborate not only those figures, but also the theme around. And I want to know a lot more 
than I knew in the very beginning. Um, does writing allow you to understand or to forgive certain things? Yes, I think um, it affords and provokes a lot of empathy. And since empathy is always a try and a need and a wish to understand others, so it, it always is a way to get closer to certain behavior, people, um, circumstances you would not have understand before. But then while doing research, while preparing, while thinking and fictionalizing and dreaming, also the dreams are very um, special and to me very helpful and important thing doing the creative process I understand a lot more I learn a lot I wouldn't say it's about forgiveness because what I'm looking for is not a moral judgment I think it's it's also a, a style or a um, perspective of all of my work I'm not um, judging on things that happen in my books or decisions or um, characters even when one of them would judge another character in the book it's not um, me who would judge but I'm interested in how it comes how they would um, come to a point to make a decision or how it comes that they could not talk or that they would lie or whatever so are you writing for yourself or to spread your point of view well it's very hard to tell it's a very hard very difficult question though i never see a reader or i never picture any reader in front of my um work or um but what what i am very sure about is from what perspective i would write a book Like um, when you um, look closer to all the novels, then you would realize that even when it's not a um, very personal perspective, like a me I telling story, but even when when like the book um, La Femme de Midi, um, ça c'est le troisième um, personne. But even then, when you, I write in third person, you very sudden learn that there is a very selective way of seeing awareness, consciousness, like in the prologue and epilogue of the Femme de Midi, it's third person, but I would not write a single sensation or observation which wouldn't be the perspective of the little boy, of her son. So he's seeing his mother, he's listening to a bird, he's walking to school, walking back home, he's waiting for his mother. Then in the end of the very first um, chapter, which is a prologue, he's waiting for his mother, realizing that he had been waited the whole night. But I'm telling the story in third person. And in the main part of the novel it's always Helena's Alice's perspective and her stream of consciousness like in the wood her experiences her surrounding so um even then there is a choice you make uh, about the dramatic um span the structure and the inlay of the perspective on what you're telling of Does the fact of changing your environment from Rome to Germany and France had an impact on your work? Yes, all of them ha had a very severe, a very strong um, effect on my work. Maybe it never had an effect that I would write exactly about Rome, the city itself, or maybe I will not write about the Perigord, I am not sure now. But being on a very different place than those places you are very familiar with. You reflect your 
familiarity and your heritage a lot more precise than you would if you would stay and remain always on the same place as you always knew. Also, when I was a student and I went to the States for half a um, year, I never ever felt so European than the half year in San Francisco. Maybe I even felt a lot more German when I came to Rome or feel a lot more German when I come to Perigord. It's not only because of language, but also the language also, and also the interactions between languages that would um, also um, provoke and energize your whole creative process on languages. It's a very, very um, important and interesting experience to me. Does Perigo bring you or give you something particular? Maybe it sounds a little emphatic or um, maybe a little weird, but I really fell in love with that region. It's so beautiful and it's um, so diverse. The first days maybe even until today, I couldn't stop walking. I couldn't um, stop walking along the woods. And I'm very sure that maybe very few people who would grow up in this beautiful region would be walkers like me, because they know. And I have a friend who grew up in the very high mountains in the Alps in northern Italy, and he told me, you know, you're such a walker, and me, myself, I I must confess, I hate the mountains because it's so much work and we always have to do all the cuttings of the grass and, and all those things with our cattle and, and, you know, to me, mountains is work and home, but um, to you, it's walking area. <laughs> so uh, we are quite opposite, and I think the same would happen to people who grew up here that would come to Berlin. They would um, explore very different things in Berlin th than I would, and they would discover maybe a lot more, or at least, let's say, different things. But what I love about Perigord is when you walk through the woods, through the forests, you have chestnuts, oaks, walnuts, wild wine all over and it's such a f variety of plants and and mushrooms and little animals and smells and it's just a absolutely um central experience to me and then of course all those um ancient sites in between where you have those abris where the Cro-Magnon um, just um, became the very first artist. And I was very surprised, I must say, I was very surprised how much I was moved and touched when I visited my first caves. Because actually I knew some of those pictures just by movies or by um, books, but I had never been in the same place with them. I never saw how tall or tiny they are, how filigrane they are made, and how much, we are talking about perspectives now, how much the perspective and the plasticity of the stone would mean to the ancient artists and their pictures and they were using the ground as well as the light and the changing of the lights I was completely um, shocked after this um, few weeks in Perigord now I think um, the whole Italian Renaissance was a really um, a high time of culture and in arts but maybe the more um, achieved, advanced um, period in, in painting and arts where, where those time like 10 to 20,000 years before Christmas. It's, it's so amazing. It almost made me cry. And this is also some um, very 
individual subjective thing with me. Uh, when I um, see certain pieces of art that are so touching, you instantly feel in those moments when being confronted with art and seeing art, understanding art, you instantly feel as if life is not about living but about loving because then somebody with his eyes from a thousand years ago is talking to you and it evokes response in yourself. This is so interesting how art can jump over a thousand of years.